Hello, and welcome to Lectures on Liberty. My name is Russell Ryan, and I'm the chair of the Economics Department here at St. Mary's College of Maryland. This series is intended to expose students, faculty, and the broader community to the history and importance of liberty from a legal, moral, and economic point of view. Uh, tonight's presentation will focus on the potential impact on the well-being of a country, specifically the United States, when government becomes too expansive in size and scope. For this presentation, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Daniel Mitchell. This is Dr. Mitchell's second presentation in the Lecture on Liberty series. In 2012, he gave the inaugura inaugural lecture of this series. Dr. Mitchell is currently a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Prior to joining Cato, Dr. Mitchell was a senior fellow with the Heritage Foundation and an economist for Senator Bob Packwood and the Senate Finance Committee. He also serves on, served on the 1988 Bush Quail Transition Team and was Director of Tax and Budget Policy for Citizens for a Sound Economy. His articles can be found in publications such as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Investors Business Daily, and Washington Times, and he is a frequent guest on radio and television. Dr. Mitchell holds a bachelor's and master's degree in economics from the University of Georgia and a PhD in economics from George Mason University. Additionally, Dr. Mitchell maintains a blog titled International Liberty, Restraining Government in America and Around the World. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Daniel Mitchell. Well, thank you, Russ. Uh, actually, I need to give you an updated version of my bio because I'm always embarrassed when people say I was on the 1988 Bush Quail transition team because that turned out to be a very big government statist administration. And also, you don't have my, my, my the publication I'm the proudest of. I've been published in Playboy. Now, it was the German Playboy, uh, but they actually won an article on Bill Clinton's economics, and for some reason, I wound up doing it. I don't read German, so all I can do is look at the pictures, but I do have the magazine. Uh, well, I want to start first by congratulating you guys on winning the, the Super Bowl. I see these Seahawks, uh, you know, jerseys and stuff like that. So, you know, that's pretty good for a small college to beat an NFL team. Uh, but I'm going to give you a very depressing presentation uh, today. I'm going to talk about where the United States is heading. And uh, if you're older, like, you know, me and Russ, we're probably okay. Uh, by the time everything goes to you know where in a handbasket, uh, you know, we'll probably have cashed out and, you know, surviving okay. Uh, but for young people, uh, when you're thinking about what your future is going to be, what your economic well-being is going to be, what your opportunities are going to be, uh, this presentation is going to be horribly depressing. So you're probably best off tonight just going out, getting drunk, forgetting about your homework and things like that. Uh, of course, I don't really mean that. Uh, let's All right, the, the clicker even works. So we're in good shape here. I'm going to just jump right in. Let me get one ground rule right at the start. It's a PowerPoint presentation. I'm not going to lose my way. If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand. If it's something you know, important, write on what I'm saying. You know, most of the Q&A will happen at the end, but I certainly don't object if somebody wants to say, well, hold on a second. I don't understand what is it you're saying. Uh, like I said, just raise your hand or even just blurt out if you want to. Uh, but let's go ahead and get into the presentation uh, and sort of lay out the situation that we face. We're in fiscal trouble. Uh, we're in fiscal trouble right now, I think, in the sense of having a spending problem. And I suppose one thing I should start right at the beginning, uh, what is the problem in fiscal policy? Most people who follow these issues, most financial journalists, economic journalists, they'll say the problem is we have deficits and debt. And that's, yeah, that's a problem, but I think it's actually the symptom. The underlying problem is the size of government. And then how you finance government is sort of a secondary issue. Now, it's a secondary issue that can become very important. If you're Greece and you spent so much money and you've gone so deeply in debt that international investors don't trust that they can lend you money anymore, and all of a sudden your interest rates on your government bonds spike up, well, yes, then that symptom in and of itself can become a crisis. But the only reason you get to the crisis point is because spending has been going up much, much faster than the private economy. And that, that's my golden rule. And I think actually I have my golden rule somewhere in the presentation. Good policy is when government grows slower than the private sector. Bad policy is when you do it the other way around 
and governments growing faster than the private sector. That happened in Greece and many other of Europe's welfare states, and that's why they got in trouble, because if government is growing faster than your private sector, in the long run, there's no amount of tax increases that are going to solve the problem. And that's why you just wind up have, having more and more red ink. And then sooner or later, as I said, when investors don't trust that you have the capacity to pay your money back, that's when things begin to get uh, very interesting. Uh, and what we've seen in recent years, uh, actually the whole 21st century, not only in the United States, but most of the Western world, we've seen a big increase in government spending, usually as measured as a share of GDP. What's GDP? That's our economic output. So how much government spending is, is a measure of, of what the economy is producing, how much of it is being diverted by politicians and, and spent on various government programs. And then, of course, we had the financial crisis, the economic downturn, not only in the U.S., but around the world. Well, when you, whenever you have an economic downturn, revenues fall, at least in the short run, uh, and that just may, means your deficits are even bigger. But this is the good news. Because as bad as things are today, they're going to be far, far worse tomorrow. And it's a simple story. It's a simple story of tax and transfer entitlement programs. What's wrong with tax and transfer entitlement programs? Well, I could give you a libertarian answer about why they're morally wrong, but I'm just going to give you a common sense mathematical explanation of what's wrong with tax and transfer entitlement programs. They are all based on the assumption that you have a population pyramid. What's a population pyramid? You've probably seen these. You know, it's a triangle. At the top, you have a, a small number of old people. Then you have a bunch of uh, middle-aged, uh, well, adults who are working age. And then you have a bigger cohort of children. And when you have that kind of demographic profile in your population with a few old people, lots of workers, and even more children coming up behind them, then your tax and transfer pay-as-you-go entitlement programs, I might argue that they're not a good idea, but they'll work. They'll work because you have uh, what's a pay-as-you-go program. The benefits that you're giving to the old people at the top of the pyramid are paid for by the current generation of workers. And then that generation of workers, when they retire, it'll be paid by the children who will then be in the working age. Uh, but what happens, as we've seen in the Western world and as is happening in America, what happens as your population pyramid slowly becomes a population cylinder? because that is what's happening in the world. Well, that's the demographics is fiscal destiny. And the United States, we're not as bad as some European countries in terms of our demographics and in terms of our entitlements, but we're not immune from the problems that uh, are now afflicting Europe. Here's a chart uh, that uh, shows the old age population ratio to working age population. I took this straight out of a, I think it was a Pew Research Foundation uh, study. And you can basically see 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, pretty much coming up to where we are right now. You can see that we roughly had about four workers for every one retiree. And again, pay-as-you-go entitlement programs, you need lots of workers to earn money, to pay taxes, to give to the, to the retirees. But what happens as our population ages? And this shows some of the major economies in the world. It also throws in Greece as an illustrative example. Well, as you see, we're heading now to where the average, the average is going to be about two workers for every retiree. Now, think about it. Imagine if you had a responsibility. Well, let's say they made it official. Any random two of you young people out there, uh, the government at some point came to you and said, okay, you've graduated. You're going out to get a job. Here's Dan Mitchell. He's a 30, 35 years older than you. As you're becoming a, a a productive member of society getting a job. Your job is to support Dan Mitchell for the next 30 years. Think about how much money you'll have to earn. Think about all the taxes that you'll pay to support whatever representative older person, uh, half of an older person is assigned to you. That's a big burden. And that's what's happening uh, to countries all around the world. Now, this chart was done uh, several years ago. I have a newer chart. It's different, but it'll show you the same thing. It's also from the Pew Research Center. Or maybe, actually, this is the one from Pew and the other one. I don't even remember where I got it from. But it shows, for years 2010 and 2050, uh, the number of dependents for every 100 people of working age. Now, this also includes younger than 15 in addition to older than 65. But it, what we're really seeing is an increase in the elderly population because birth rates around the world, especially in the developed world, are very, very low.
Well, you see that in the US, we're gonna go from 49 to 66. We're lucky, that's bad. But look at Japan, 96, Spain, 94. Well, I gave the example, pick two of you students and say you're gonna support me for the rest of my life. Imagine if one of you students had to support me for the rest of your life. I hope I pick a rich one if, I, if that's what happens. But imagine these numbers, imagine these numbers in the context of tax and transfer pay-as-you-go entitlements. The numbers simply don't add up. Even if you believe in big government, you don't have to be a libertarian, you don't have to be a small government conservative. If you simply know math, these numbers are horrifying. And, these, and, and you know, going from 49 to 66, that basically means instead of one, two of you supporting one of me, it basically, well, let's make sure I have the math right, it means three of you have to support me and Russ. You know, so, so, so your burden's getting heavier. Instead of supporting half of an old person, you're supporting two-thirds of an old person. The numbers are very, very grim. And I'm going to show you how they're grim uh, because uh, we're going to sh show a bunch of charts. Uh, this simply says that the demographics in countries are bad. Let me skip to the charts. Uh, these are all these charts I'm going to show you are all from a study from the Bank for International Settlements uh, based in uh, Switzerland. Very sober, bunch of boring uh, international bureaucrats. But they basically took about, I don't know, 10 to 12 major economies, and they looked between, well, the, when the, the numbers, I guess, were in 2011, uh, and the black vertical line is, I guess, when the recession hit. But in 2011, when this study came out, they looked at, okay, what is the projected path of debt for these countries? Now, I actually wish they had looked at the projected path of government spending because I, I'd much rather look at the real problem rather than a symptom of the problem. But nonetheless, you can basically look at these charts that I'm about to show you, and, and the red line, as you see, is the baseline scenario. In other words, if politicians do nothing else than simply sit on their hands and let the current built-in spending increases take place, what's going to happen? Well, in France, 400% of GDP for debt. Greece, just to give you a little bit of background, had a fiscal crisis at 113% of GDP. Spain and Portugal hit their fiscal crisis at about 75, 85% of GDP. So obviously, if you're heading up to 400% of GDP, very, very bad things are gonna happen. And that's what France, what's gonna happen to France, even if politicians for the rest of eternity don't add one additional program or expand any existing commitments to spend money. And of course, that's all French politicians exist for. For that matter, that's what American politicians love doing. Now, the green and the blue lines show what will happen if you do a good bit of reform and if you do a lot of reform. You know, the, uh, and a lot of reform basically means holding age-related spending constant. That's a big that would be a very big undertaking given the aging of population. So, so the green and blue lines are assessments of, well, if politicians really did a lot of stuff, what might happen to debt in the long run? You still see it's going to be about 200% of GDP in France, so they're going to hit a fiscal crisis. As a matter of fact, if any of you in here are multimillionaire investors, the, the next three countries to watch for in terms of a fiscal crisis, Japan, France, and Belgium. Um, now, of course, if that turns out to be wrong, don't come looking to me to make up your losses. So there's France. Here's Germany. Everyone thinks Germany is the responsible uh, country of the world. They're heading up to 300% of GDP. Now, apparently, if they do a lot of reform, they can actually stabilize things somewhere between, say, you know, uh, 50 and 150% of GDP, but still a large amount of debt. So Germany has a big problem in front of them. And by the way, all of these countries... The demographics explain a lot. The demographics explain a lot because the birth rates are so low. Those are the younger workers that are needed to support the entitlement programs. But again, pyramid, cylinder. If all you remember from my speech, pyramid, cylinder. Well, hopefully you'll remember the context of it so you don't think it was a math lecture because who would want that? Here's our, our favorite country of Greece. Uh, they're heading up to 400% of GDP. Uh, if they do a ton of reform, they'll stabilize at 150% of GDP. Of course, these numbers are worse now compared to where they were in 2011 when the BIS did the study. Here's Ireland, the country of my ancestors. They actually had done a pretty good job reducing government spending and lowering their debt levels uh, for a long period. But then they did massive bank bailouts, had a big bubble in their economy, uh, and everything's pretty much gone to you know where. 
uh, since that happened, and their long-run prognosis, 300% of GDP, even with a lot of reforms, they're going up to 150 to 200% of GDP. That's not a pretty number at all. Ireland actually has a, still a semi-decent birth rate. Uh, actually, there's nothing good or bad about any given birth rate, but if you have tax and transfer entitlement programs, you better hope people are reproducing like bunnies, and that's just not happening in most countries. Here's Italy, 250% uh, of GDP. That's actually surprisingly good. You know, the stereotype is that the Germans are the responsible ones and the Italians are the ones in trouble. Well, they are heading into trouble, but they actually, it seems, to have a decent path to get out of it if they do a lot of reform, which, of course, they're not doing. Here's the Netherlands, somewhere between 400% of GDP if they do nothing and stabilizing a little bit under 100% under of GDP if they do a lot. Here's Japan. I said they're one of the countries that's going to go belly up. You can see it in these numbers, 600% of GDP. Now, they're already at 200% of GDP, which is the highest in the world. Now, how do they get away with it? How did Greece have a fiscal crisis at 113% of GDP, and Japan hasn't had one yet at 200%? Because it's almost all domestically financed. Japanese savers, and they save a lot of money, uh, pretty much through government regulations uh, and distortions, their, their savings are funneled into government debt. So the Japanese are lending themselves money, uh, which all sounds okay, except for the fact that in the long run, there are no younger Japanese to, uh, to pay off those bonds when they come due over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And by the way, this is, uh, all these charts I'm showing you are to 2040. That's what, 26 years from now? That's when you students are supposedly going to be in your prime working uh, years, earning your most money. Uh, well, guess where all that money is going to go? The government's going to be taking it, uh, at least of your, from your Japanese counterparts and your German and your Greek counterparts. So, and by the way, Japan, even if they do a ton of reform, 400% of GDP. I mean, they're toast. At some point in time, we're going to have a very interesting social science experiment. Uh, what happens when an economy self-implodes and crumbles upon itself? And Japan will be that case study. Here's Portugal. They've already gotten bailouts. These numbers are far worse than they were in 2011. But just take this as an illustration of Portugal heading up to 300% of GDP. Spain, pretty much the same story, 300% of GDP. They've already gotten a bailout like Portugal, like Italy, like Ireland, like Greece. Here's the United Kingdom. This is kind of a surprise because uh, if you follow international economic policy, I don't recommend you do. It's kind of boring. But if you follow it, the United Kingdom is supposed to be part of the Anglo-Saxon world. They're the responsible ones, not those continental Europeans. The Anglo-Saxon world is free market, small government. No, it's not. 500% of GDP for the United Kingdom, even if they do a lot of reform, 300% of GDP. The United Kingdom is in deep, deep trouble. I don't think they crumble as fast as France, Belgium, and uh, Japan, but it's not a good long-run picture. Now, if we have a drum roll, the United States, 400% of GDP, worse than Greece, worse than Spain, worse than Portugal, worse than Italy. We are in deep, long-run trouble. This is basically the baby boom generation retiring. And even if we do a lot of reform, we're somewhere between 200 and 300 percent of GDP, which is far, far higher than we are right now. That should scare every single young person in terms of thinking about your future and whether or not you're going to have a good life, be able to buy the things that you want to do, get the kind of jobs that you want, and uh, travel. And all the good things that presumably we like to get out of life are going to be a lot harder when you have an entitlement state mixed with these demographics. Now, these were all Bank for International Settlement numbers. And some of you may be thinking, OK, yeah, I sort of think the Swiss are responsible, intelligent people who can add and subtract, but maybe there's something wrong with the study. I want to see some other data. Well, let's look at some other data. This is a chart taken from a study by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And uh, these are all the countries you can, you know, I don't know if you can see the uh, little abbreviations at the bottom and figure them out, but basically it's showing what you have to do starting right now and maintain every single year into the future in terms of fiscal consolidation in order to stabilize your debt levels by 2050. So instead of looking to 2040, we're looking to 2050 right now. And all you really need to understand about this chart is you don't want to be on this side of the chart. You want to be on that side of the chart. Where's, what's the worst country in the world? Japan. Well, we sort of figure that out from the BIS data. Who's the third worst country in the world? the U.S. 
as I say in my little uh, uh, editorial addition to the chart here, uh, we're in worse shape than Greece, France, and Italy. And again, this is these are your prime working years where politicians are going to be saying, oh my God, we need to figure out how to grab giant chunks of money in order to somehow scotch tape and duct tape and tie this thing together so that it doesn't fall apart uh, around us. So this is what the OECD has to say. Uh, and the U.S. is, well, I mean, I suppose, let me add, if you look on the left axis, 12% of GDP every single year. What's U.S. GDP? 16, 17 trillion dollars. The U.S. is about 10% of GDP. 10% of GDP every single year between now and 2050. What's 10% of GDP? I guess $1.6 trillion. Where is the government going to get $1.6 trillion a year? They're going to get it from you during your prime working years. Not an encouraging thought. Here's a very complicated chart from the International Monetary Fund. It's very complicated, but it's actually my favorite chart because instead of looking at the symptom of red ink and government debt, it looks at the actual underlying problem of government spending. So the vertical axis is the increase just in age-related spending between now and 2030. So we're talking just 16 years. So on the vertical axis, the increase in spending, and on the horizontal axis, the fiscal adjustment that is necessary. So, the, and that's, so in effect, the horizontal axis is like that previous chart. It shows how much you need to do on a sustained basis every single year to avoid the fiscal crisis. So if the spending increases are on the vertical axis, the amount of change you need to, st to stave off problems is on the horizontal axis, what can we say? We can say that the last place you want to be is in the upper right quadrant. What nation is farthest out in the upper right quadrant? The United States. Now, Belgium and looks like Slovenia, Finland have more spending increases built in, at least for age-related programs. And Japan, of course, has more fiscal adjustment that they have to do than the U.S. But the U.S. has the worst of both worlds. And again, this is just over the next 16 years. So good luck to you students thinking that you're going to have, you know, really get your career going over the next 5, 10, 15 years. These are big, major problems. In other words, this cartoon is probably a lot. I should have just shown this cartoon. This is taxpayers, and these are all the various claims on the taxpayers. What happens if there's nothing more to steal? I'm, of course, editorializing there that when governments tax people, they're stealing their money. Uh, so uh, you can take that for what it's worth. Uh, but, but this is what's happened to Greece. This is what is happening to Italy and Spain and Portugal. This is what's going to happen to Japan. This is what's going to happen to France and Belgium. And sooner or later, if we don't change things, it's going to happen to the United States. Now, these are cartoons that I had an intern. We had an intern from Italy at the Cato Institute. She was a very good artist. Wasn't probably very good at other things. Uh, but this is basically how the welfare state begins. And the reason I'm showing you this cartoon is because the welfare state begins for at for noble sounding reasons. I don't want to say they're noble because I don't think tax and transfer at the end of the day is a moral system. Uh, simply because three people vote to gang up on one person, that doesn't make it moral. Uh, so I've never been a, a majoritarian. Uh, I'm like the, the founding fathers. They, they did not believe in majoritarianism. They believed in a set of rules to constrain government called the Constitution. But the welfare state basically began with what sounded like a noble idea. It began with the idea, hey, there are lots of us in this room. Why don't all of us in this room chip in a little bit of money to take care of anybody who falls on hard times? So let's say that you right there with the gray sweater, you break your leg. Wouldn't it be good if all of us just chipped in a little bit of money? You wouldn't have to worry about potential crisis in terms of your, you know, keeping your lifestyle going. So, so everyone chips in a little bit of money and, and what? Well, that sounds really great. So let, let's actually set up a system called government and programs to do that. We'll all chip in a little bit of money. There are lots and lots of us pulling the wagon and very few people riding in the wagon. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the congressional record and read the debates from when the Social Security Act was passed, if you read the debates from when Medicare and Medicaid and programs like that were created, you'll see explicitly the supporters of those programs said this will be very easy to afford because lots of people will be chipping in, we'll, it'll be very inexpensive, and very few people uh, will need to utilize the programs. But what happens over time? Well, this is how the welfare state begins. 
and this is how it ends. This is a picture of modern Greece. Figuratively, of course. It's a cartoon. I had to say that because Russ sometimes he takes these things too literally. Uh, but this is a picture, figuratively, of modern Greece. Because if you add together in Greece the number of people who are collecting benefits from the government, and my favorite story there was the guy who got a 700 euro a month disability payment for blindness when he worked, off the books of course, uh, as a tour guide for bird watchers. So you have all the people collecting welfare and disability and things like that in Greece. Then you have all the people working for the government in Greece, or I should say employed by the government, since I suspect very few of them work. Uh, but that's another big chunk of the population. And then you have all the retirees in Greece. And my favorite story there is that if you're in a hazardous profession, you can retire as early as age 48 on the taxpayer, and those hazardous professions include hairstyling, because you're working with dyes, and those have chemicals in them. So you add together the welfare recipients, the government bureaucrats, and the retirees, you're at roughly 57 to 60% of the Greek voting age population. And you wonder why Greece doesn't reform itself. You wonder why Greece is getting bailouts. You wonder why Greece is probably, at this stage, fundamentally ungovernable. Because when people think that it's a human right to take money from other people and that they shouldn't have to work, well, guess what? At some point, the people pulling the wagon figure this out, and they either climb in the wagon themselves, or they just say, screw it, they drop the rope and go do something else. So we're facing a crisis. You look at those charts from the IMF, the BIS, and the OECD. You look at the demographic data on the United States and other countries, and basically, the future is bad. We're, go we're going to have a crisis. Now, there's two theoretical responses to that crisis. Uh, if you're on the left, you're probably worried that a crisis is going to lead to a resurgence of capitalism. And that's, that's the whole uh, uh, Naomi Klein who wrote Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism. That's what she's afraid of. Oh my goodness, we're hitting a fiscal crisis and countries are going to start limiting government. Isn't that horrible? Now, on the right or on the libertarian side, since he's a libertarian, you have Robert Higgs, author of Crisis and Leviathan, Critical Episodes in the Growth of American Government. And Higgs says that, no, no, Usually when you have a crisis, politicians use that as an excuse to accumulate even more power. Who's right? Well, it depends. If you look at uh, you know, the former Soviet bloc, the collapse of big government led to more freedom. On the other hand, if you look at, say, uh, the US history, you know, we had a Great Depression because of government intervention. Did that lead to less government intervention? No, it led to even more government intervention. Uh, wars usually lead to an expansion of government. So, so we don't really know. We know that there's going to be a crisis, but I don't think there's any theoretical answer that tells us automatically what the response to that crisis is. But I'm pessimistic. But don't worry, I'm going to give you the optimistic side of this as well. I'm pessimistic. Why? because I don't think politicians are well suited to give us the right answers that we need to try to save the country. First of all, they like buying votes with other people's money. Look at the Bush administration, look at the Obama administration. I'm not making a partisan point at all. Uh, sometimes they have different constituencies and interest groups they like to pay off and bribe, but they all love spending other people's money. Uh, and they don't like reducing or even restraining the growth of spending. Why? because interest groups now think they're entitled to receive money. It doesn't matter whether you're a farmer or a welfare recipient, you're still getting a welfare check, it's just somehow you, you, the different groups all think they're entitled to this money. And when they think they're entitled to the money, what happens when politicians try to say, ho, oh, oh, oh. then they get upset, they vote against the politicians, and the most relevant interest group of all is the elderly, because they're the ones who are the primary beneficiaries of these tax and transfer entitlement programs. And since we have a rising elderly population, what are the odds that politicians are going to want to irritate that demographic group that has a very high voting turnout ratio? When you're old, sometimes you don't have a lot to do, so sitting for three hours in a polling line might not be the worst thing to do with your day. Uh, whereas young people, we all like to think, you know, we, <laughs> you, uh, you like to think, wow, we're the young, committed, idealistic people. You have the lowest voting uh, turnout because you probably have better things to do. And then us middle-aged people, I guess we're in the middle. That's why we're middle-aged. So the question is, to what extent is America a frog? 
I don't know if you've all ever heard the little parable about if you drop a frog in boiling water or hot water, it's going to hop out right away. But if you put a frog in temperate water and then slowly ratchet up the temperature, by the time he figures out he's being boiled, it's too late. All his energy is sapped away, and he winds up being frog legs for dinner. So the question is, will America wake up? Will something happen to change that negative, pessimistic scenario I outlined of politicians doing the wrong thing because the people who have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo have more power than the diffuse taxpayers who, who theoretically should be very involved but tend not to be as interested in government policy as the people who have their snout stuck in the public trough. And of course, if government spending is rising and rising and rising because of the changing demographics and poorly designed entitlement programs, what does that suggest about the tax side of the fiscal ledger? Well, it suggests lots of very bad things. It means that we're going to look at an endless series of tax hikes all through your future. It means that there's going to be more efforts to increase tax rates and to expand double taxation. It means that politicians will probably try to apply the payroll tax to all income by busting what's known as the wage base cap, and that'll be a huge tax increase on entrepreneurs, investors, and small business owners, the people who actually create the jobs that you young people will want to fill when you get out of college. Uh, but I think the biggest threat in the long run, and by the way, I haven't even mentioned energy taxes, wealth taxes, and things like that, that politicians are salivating about. The biggest battle in my mind, which frankly may determine whether or not the country can be saved, is the value-added tax. What's a value-added tax? It's basically a national sales tax, the European-style national sales tax, except it's not something that gets levied at the cash register. It's built in at every stage of the production process, which is why they call it a value-added tax. You go from the raw material to the manufacturer to this you know, whole distributor, wholesaler, retailer, tax, 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 tax. And so when you buy something as a consumer in Europe, you're saying, wow, this is like 50% you know, uh, more expensive than it is in the United States. Well, part of that, of course, is all their regulations and things like that, but part of it is the value-added tax. Uh, and so if you get a value-added tax, it is a huge source of revenue for politicians. Uh, and of course, it's a huge, uh, uh, heavy weight on the economy. Uh, and that's, that's my concern. If politicians get a VAT, it's very easy for them. OK, we put in this introductory VAT at 5%. Oh, look at that. Our red ink is getting higher because more people are retiring. Our entitlement programs are under pressure. Let's increase the VAT from 5 to 6. Then two years later, from 6 to 7. Three years after that, uh, 7 to 8. Two years after that, 8 to 9. That's basically the story of Europe. If you look at the data from, say, the mid-1960s, and you compare the burden of government in the United States to the burden of government in Europe, what are you going to see? You're going to see that they're roughly similar. I mean, the Europeans were a little bit higher than us. But over time, what's happened is that the Europeans' government got a lot bigger, a lot. It's gotten bigger in America, but it got a lot bigger, a lot faster in Europe. Why? Because they had that source of revenue. If you're a heroin addict, or let's say there's two heroin addicts, and you give one two sources of heroin, and the other only has one source of heroin, which heroin addict do you think is going to become more of a junkie? obviously the one with two sources of heroin. And when you have an income tax and a value-added tax, uh, that's, like, that's like catnip for politicians. Uh, and, and there's a lot of politicians in Washington, I can assure you, who, who would give their left arms uh, to have a value-added tax. Now, of course, the question is, well, but on a blackboard, tax increases will work. We have these long-run deficits. Can't we just fill up these long-run deficits with a tax increase? Won't that just be fine? Won't it be hunky-dory? Uh, we'll all sing kumbaya around a fireplace and eat s'mores, and uh, you know it'll be great. Well, yeah, in theory. In theory, if you raise taxes, uh, there won't be a fiscal crisis because the politicians will fund all this future spending with the new sources of revenue they get from a VAT and from other sources. And then the so-called bond vigilantes, you know, the international investors who cut Greece off, uh, they'll, be, they'll be happy. Well, of course, there's a real world problem with this. All the European countries that have had fiscal crises, they had the VAT. They had the income tax as well. And what you really are seeing is, in the real world, you have two negative effects from tax increases. First, they encourage more spending. Think about it. If you're a politician, you're spending money, you're having a happy time, you're buying votes with other people's money, but you're sort of limited by how much you can spend because, yeah, you're, you're spending every penny you collect, and then you're running deficits because, okay, I can, I can get away with a deficit of, say, 5% of GDP. So how much can I spend? Well, I'll spend all the taxes I collect, 
and then I'll spend an additional 5% of GDP. What happens if you get a tax increase? You're going to spend all that money. You've already decided you can get away with deficits of 5% of GDP, so you're still going to have deficits. And again, if you look at the European data, that's exactly what we see. Back in the mid-1960s, before there were value-added taxes in Europe, you had big governments, well, not, not as big as they are now, but you, know, let's, you had medium-sized governments with medium-sized deficits, then they put in the value-added tax, and you have big governments with even bigger deficits. If you care about real-world re, real data, if you actually think that facts matter, well, there's just no evidence that these tax increases avert or solve fiscal crises. And the second reason why they're a big problem is that the more you tax of something, the less you get of it. Politicians understand this, by the way, when they want to. You know, politicians are always banging their fist on a podium saying, we should have higher taxes on tobacco because we want people to smoke less. Now, I'm a libertarian. I don't want to govern other people's private lives, so I disagree with them philosophically. But you know what? As an economics, if I was an economics professor, if I was you, I would give those politicians an A+. Because they understand the more you tax of something, the less you get of it. At least on tobacco, they understand it. All of a sudden, when we're talking about taxes on work, saving, investment, risk-taking, entrepreneurship, then they forget those lessons. Oh, no, we can raise taxes on those bad rich people. We can have higher income tax rates, and we can increase the double taxation on dividends and capital gains. No problem whatsoever. But in the real world, those things weaken economic performance. It's no mystery why countries like France and Italy and whatnot are lucky to grow 1.5% a year in the average in the long run. So you raise taxes. The politicians will spend every penny they think they're going to get, but then in reality, they won't get that much revenue because the tax base, i.e. economic output, won't grow as fast. So you get this double whammy of the tax increases, encouraging more spending and reducing the long-run ability of the economy to spin off tax revenue. So tax hikes don't avert a crisis. Tax hikes make a crisis more likely. And this Laffer curve is sort of the graphical representation of what I was just saying. What's the Laffer curve basically say? Well, if you have a 0% tax rate, how much money does the government collect? Nothing. How much money does the government collect at 100%? Maybe not nothing. There might be some genetic communists in the world. But presumably, most of us wouldn't work if the government stole every penny we made. So at a 100% tax rate, the government doesn't get anything. At a 0% tax rate, the government doesn't get anything. So somewhere in between 0 and 100, you have this parabola. And pretty much every economist in the world will agree with this. Even Paul Krugman would agree with this. Where there's disagreement is the shape of the curve. But I don't really care about the shape of the curve because I'm not interested in maximizing revenue. I'm interested in maximizing growth. And I think you maximize growth when government is small. And so if you have a small government, yeah, you could probably raise revenue by raising tax rates. But why would you want to do that? All you're doing is making government bigger, putting a bigger drain on the private sector. Uh, so anyhow, there is a Laffer curve, and I want to show you an example of it. This is, this is data from the IRS Statistics of Income Bulletin. It comes out every single year. You can go to irs.gov. I wouldn't recommend it. They'll probably start tracking you. But if you go to the Statistics of Income Bulletin at irs.gov, you can pull out the data broken down by income levels, and you can see that the so-called rich people, those making over $200,000 a year, in 1980, we had about 117,000 of those rich people. They declared about $36 billion of income to the IRS, and they paid $19 billion to Uncle Sam. Now, why am I using this year? Because this is the year we had a top tax rate of 70%. This is before the Reagan tax cuts. So we definitely had a class warfare tax system. We were taxing the heck out of those rich people. 70% top rate. Reagan took that 70% top rate and lowered it all the way down to 28%. And what happened? Well. The Ted Kennedys and whatnot of the world at the time said, this is unfair, this is wrong, the government's going to be starved of revenue, the rich aren't going to pay enough. So what actually happened to revenue? Now remember, 70% tax rate, the government collected $19 billion. Reagan lowered the tax rate to 28%. What happened to revenue? Did it proportionally fall to, I guess, what, about $8.5 billion? Did it maybe only fall to $15 billion, showing that the tax cut partially paid for itself? Did revenue stay at $19 billion, showing that the tax cut fully paid for itself? Or did revenues actually rise, which would imply, actually, I don't know how to go backwards on this thing, so I can't show you the Laffer curve uh, anymore. But 
if you have a tax rate that's past the revenue maximizing point on the curve, if you lower the tax rate, you can actually collect more revenue because the increase in economic activity is going to more than offset the impact of the lower tax rate. So what happened in, in the 1980s? If we are to look, and we're about to, at the 1988 data from the IRS, not numbers that I made up at Cato, what are we going to see in terms of revenues from the rich? Anybody want to hazard a guess? $19 billion, $19 billion with a 70% tax rate at a 28% tax rate, how much did the government collect from the rich? This is class participation. You know, you probably, if you're in one of Russ's class, you get an extra five points. 25 billion? Okay, so you're saying it was a, f a fully paid for tax cut. Same? Well, pick something different. We have, well, this is a contest. Anybody else want to guess? Very, very shy class. Well, let's look at the numbers. Nearly $100 billion in revenue from these evil, bad, rich people. Why? Well, all of a sudden there were a lot more of them, which I assume is a good thing. Uh, but most importantly at all, of all, they dramatically increased their taxable income. One thing I should say, to, some people just look at these numbers and they just can't grasp them. So let me explain something about rich people. I'm not one of them, but there are some Cato donors that fit in that category. And when you talk to rich people, whether because they're Cato donors or other people, one thing you will find out is that rich people have tremendous control over the timing, level, and composition of their income. Now, Barack Obama wants to run this experiment in reverse, and lots of other politicians want to run this experiment in reverse. They want tax rates to go back up to where they were in the 60s and the 70s. What is going to happen? If you're a rich person, you can get on your computer, your brokerage accounts or whatever, and just like that, you can move every single penny of your wealth into tax-free municipal bonds. Or if you're a rich person, you can move every single penny of your investments into growth stocks. What are growth stocks? That's just a buzzword for saying stocks that you expect to appreciate in value, but not ones that pay out dividends. Why? Because dividends are taxable. Unrealized capital gains, which is what happens, you buy a stock for $10, it goes to 20. That's unrealized. The government can't tax, they probably would like to tax you on that, but they've never figured out a way to do it. So as a rich person, you can overnight completely protect yourself from higher tax rates. But also what happens is when the government lowers tax rates, all of a sudden you're thinking, huh, these, these municipal bonds, oh, I don't really like them. I was only investing in them because tax rates were so high. I don't want to lend money to Detroit. I don't want to lend money to Cleveland. I don't want to lend money to New Jersey. I'd rather put it in productive private sector assets because I want to benefit from the income that those will generate. Or I don't want to put my money in just uh, you know growth stocks. I want to put them in dividend stocks because my, the economy is growing better. So when tax rates are low, guess what happens? You get more rich people declaring more income because they don't have the incentive to evade and avoid taxes as much anymore. Uh, but it, again, we are heading toward a future where tax rates are going up. And as I said in one of the, the earlier slides, that's not going to give the politicians the revenue they think they're going to get. So let's actually now go to the happy part of the presentation. Uh, the happy part of the presentation is, what's the solution to this mess? Uh, well, a couple of ground rules. You have to understand what goal you have. You have to understand the policies that will get you to that goal. You have to figure out how to implement those policies, and then you have to make them stick. And that's very, very hard. Why? Because what I said before, the reason I'm pessimistic, politicians have very little reason to follow these four steps. So. To sort of answer the first part of those four questions, we're going to step back here and do a little bit of economics. Not too boring. I think it's only three or four slides. What's the goal of economic policy? Presumably to make the country richer. I hope nobody disagrees with that. Some environmentalists disagree with it. We should all be in, in like little huts uh, composting uh, stuff like that. But for the most part, you know, 99% of the people in the real world uh, want to be richer. Uh, and if you have a rich economy, what happens? You have a large tax base. The more income people have, the bigger the tax base, which means, of course, you can finance legitimate functions of government at low tax rates. And since I'm a libertarian, I can't help but point out freedom's a good thing. Government coercion's not a good thing. So wouldn't it be nice to actually have more individual freedom? So let's now talk about the underlying economics of how you might get that richer economy. Every single economist 
just like they'd all agree that 100% tax rates don't maximize revenue. Every single economist is going to agree with the basic, what's called a production function in economics. How do you get economic output? You mix capital and labor together. So there's only a handful of ways to increase the amount of wealth your economy is producing. You either have more labor, more capital, or you use your existing labor and capital more efficiently. You know, you can, you can pay a worker to dig holes and fill them back in again, as Keynes said. That's not increasing your economy's productive output. So that's, that's an example of whether your labor is used efficiently. Uh, allocation of capital. You can have government doing things like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac creating a housing bubble. That's probably not the best way to use your capital. You want to use your capital in ways that actually generate sustainable, permanent, long-run increases in living standards. So the way to think about it is that labor and capital are the ingredients. Who's the chef? Well, the chef is the one who mixes these ingredients together. But what kind of chef do we want? Do we want private sector chefs or do we want government chefs? Now, I'm never one to claim that there are no mistakes in the private sector. You look at the failure rate of new businesses, it's spectacular. As, as high as 9 out of 10 small businesses will fail. But some become big businesses. Some become wildly successful. Some give us new, uh, exciting products. Some deliver us better services. Uh, the thing about the private sector that makes it different than the government is the feedback mechanism. In the private sector, there are very painful consequences to failure. You lose your money. And so there's a constantly sort of self-reinforcing process that is leading entrepreneurs to try to figure out, how can I do this better? How can I be successful? And of course, the only way you can be successful is by coming up with products, goods, and services that are going to make people's lives better. You get rich in a genuinely capitalist economy. You get rich by making other people's lives better. And that feedback mechanism encourages you to do that because you lose money if you don't. But what about the government? The feedback mechanism not only doesn't exist, but if it does, it's perverse. The more a program fails, the more the politicians will say, oh, we need more money. Oh, look at this. We have 47 federal job training programs. All the independent studies say they don't work. People don't, don't have a higher likelihood of getting jobs. They don't get more pay on the jobs they do get. So let's create more and give them more money. That's the feedback mechanism you get in government. Oh, look, government created a housing crisis. Let's spend more money on housing. That is why it's very important. Labor and capital is what generates all the output that we get in our economy. Who do you want to mix that labor and capital together is a very, very important question. Now let me show you why economic growth matters. Let's say you're Italy. You grow 1% a year. Actually, the whole 21st century, they've had no growth. But let's, be op let's have an optimistic assessment of Italy. 1% growth that takes them 70 years to double their GDP. 70 years. What happens, though, if you have a fast-growing economy, 4, 5, 6, 7% growth? You double your GDP in less than 20 years. And, and, and these aren't fantasy numbers. There are countries, jurisdictions like Hong Kong and Singapore, that year in, year out, decade after decade, are averaging 5, 6% growth. And that's why they've gone from being some of the poorer places in the planet at the end of World War II to being some of the richer places in the planet. Economic growth matters. Now, I, I have a hard time when I go up to Capitol Hill and I'm briefing politicians and their staff, I sometimes have a hard time getting this across because I say, well, you know, if we did this reform, uh, if we lowered this tax rate or, or got rid of this program, we might get, you know, two-tenths of 1% faster growth. And they're thinking two-tenths of 1%, that's such a small number. Why do I care? Well, if you're planning on dying next year, which I hope none of you are, two-tenths of 1% probably doesn't matter. You probably won't even notice it. But over a long period of time, differences in economic growth matter a lot because of what Albert Einstein called the most powerful force in the universe, compound interest. In other words, compounding. If you get a little bit faster growth this year and then build upon it with a little bit faster growth next year and so on and so forth, it makes a big difference. As a matter of fact, if we got two-tenths of 1% faster growth and sustained it, by the time we're 25 years down the road for the average American household, that's between four and $5,000 of higher income. It's hugely important what growth you have. We used to have average growth in America of 3%. Now we're down to average growth of about 2.2%. I think that's a consequence of the big government policies of Bush and Obama.
Uh, and uh, as we go from 3% to 2%, it makes a difference. And as we become more like Europe, we have, if we adopt a value-added tax, then we'll be down at 1%. So it matters a lot. We know how we get growth. We know that growth matters. But unfortunately, as government gets bigger and bigger and politicians are the chefs mixing labor and capital together, we're going to get worse and worse results. Now let's talk a little bit about what's good tax policy and what's good spending policy and then sort of lay out in my conclusion something vaguely optimistic. What's good tax policy? Low tax rates. What's good tax policy? Don't double tax saving and investing. What's good tax policy? Don't have government pick winners and losers in the tax code. And also territorial taxation, which for our purposes actually isn't too important. Why do you want a low tax rate? Well, remember the example I gave you before about taxing tobacco? Politicians understood that the more you tax tobacco, the less you get of it. Why do we want to tax work saving and investment at high rates? Uh, not only are you going to lead to less economic output, but you're also going to increase incentives to hide, shelter, and underreport income. And the research shows that tax rates of 20% or above is where you begin to influence people's incentives. Now, by the way, I'm a libertarian. I want to go back to what we had for most of our nation's history, a federal government so small we don't need an income tax. So I'm not saying that this is my ideal world, but I'm saying, okay, we have a government that's too big today, but at least let's figure out how to have tax rates as low as possible, and we could, we could do a Hall Rabushka style flat tax that satisfies all those criteria I just had in the previous slide, you could do that at less than 20%. So if you want to actually try to have a tax system that generates revenue without punishing productive activity, try to get your tax rates under 20%. And also, try to make sure you tax income only one time. Every, I, I keep saying all the things economists agree upon, capital and labor, tax rates of 100% not maximizing revenue. Something else all economists agree on is that capital formation is one of the keys to long-run growth. Simply stated, you can't have significant growth if you're not setting aside some of today's income to finance the savings and investments that give you tomorrow's growth. Now, the, the socialists and the Marxists are a little bit mixed up. They think government can do the saving and the investing. We, sort of, we saw how well that worked in the Soviet Union, or for that matter, with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, but the, 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 the key thing to understand, and I'll show you this chart, which I think will make it a lot more clear, we double tax, triple tax, quadruple tax income that is saved and invested. In other words, if you consume all your income right away, which doesn't give you future economic growth, the government, by and large, leaves you alone. But if you save and invest, you do what is socially optimal, what is best for other people, for future workers, and things like that. The government punishes you. And let's look at an example. You probably can't read these boxes, but the top green box is you're a worker, you earn money. What's the first thing that happens? The government takes some of it from you. So then the second green box is your after-tax earnings. What can you do with your after-tax earnings? Well, there's really only two things you can do with Well, actually, I suppose you could just burn it in a pile, but most people don't do that. Uh, there are two things you can do with your after-tax earnings if you're a normal person. You can either spend the money right away or you can save and invest it, which basically means spend the money in the future. Now, on the left side, show, it shows what happens if you spend your after-tax income right away. If you spend your after-tax income right away, the federal government leaves you alone. Not totally. I mean, you know, if you buy a gallon of gas, there's a federal excise tax on that. There are, there are a few federal consumption taxes, but we don't have any federal sales tax. We don't have a federal value added tax or anything like that. If you consume your after-tax income, the federal government leaves you alone. What happens if you do the socially optimal thing to benefit your fellow man and you save and invest your after-tax income? Well, these blue boxes, blue boxes on the right side, between the capital gains tax, the corporate income tax, the double tax on dividends, and the death tax, you can be taxed as many as four different times. Now think about it. You go down one path, you're unmolested. You go down the other path, someone beats you over the head with a two by four. What are you going to do? Is there any mystery after you look at this why we have a low savings rate in America? We punish the people who save and invest. And that undermines our long-run growth. Now, of course, we have policies like, you know, we have IRAs and 401ks, which sort of protect you from one form of double taxation. We tax dividends and capital gains at slightly lower rates than we uh, tax ordinary income. They should be taxed at zero because there shouldn't be any double taxation. Uh, and, of course, you're allowed to pass on several million dollars to your kids before there's a death tax. Uh, but for the rich people who have a lot of capital, the death tax is a very real, very significant thing that destroys a lot of capital in the economy. So our tax code does not fulfill 
the principle of good tax policy of taxing income only one time. And then, of course, the neutrality issue is basically don't pick winners and losers. I mean, what is the purpose of loopholes, preferences, deductions, exclusions, and exemptions in the tax code? The purpose is to bribe taxpayers to do things that don't make economic sense. Now, let's actually wrap our minds around that. Huh, if I do this in a hypothetical world with no income tax, that's the best thing for society because I'm using my labor and capital the most efficiently. But the government is putting these little pots of honey over here to tell me to go down this route instead. Now, I'm sure if the pots of honey were big enough, we might all invest our money in factories that make candy bars that taste like onions and peppers. How many kids are going to buy candy bars that taste like onions and pepper? Probably not many. But with enough bribes in the tax code, we get stuff like that. It's called ethanol, uh, for one example. Uh, you know, so, so you get all sorts of really screwy decisions made in terms of the tax code uh, because governments have put, we, well, we have what, 75,000 pages of tax law. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily 75,000 pages of corrupt preferences and distortions, but it means a heck of a lot of them. And when you're being bribed to do things that are economically inefficient, there is a cost to economic growth. Now let's talk about government spending real quickly. Uh, and let me skip to a chart that I think makes it a little bit easier to explain, especially since I want to make sure I leave time for Q&A and I'm, I can see I'm just getting all agitated with myself here. Just like there's a Laffer curve on revenue, there's something called the Ron curve on government spending. And what the Ron curve basically shows, you have economic performance on the vertical axis, and you have the size of government on the horizontal axis. And what you see is that as governments get bigger, economic growth is slower. And the academic research out there basically says, and I think I have this on the next slide, yeah, they basically say that the total size of government, federal, state, and local, or national, provincial, you know, whatever, the, whatever you call your different jurisdictions in different countries, but total government all added together, the growth maximizing size of government should be about 20% of GDP. Every single Western nation, all those countries that I showed you in those early charts at the start of the presentation, are spending way above 20% of GDP. Federal, state, and local in the U.S., we're spending about 36 to 39% of GDP, depending on how you measure it. I actually think the growth maximizing size of government is a lot lower than 20% of GDP. Because if you remember that curve, 20% of GDP was the growth maximizing size of government. Let's say that you were an intern at the Cato Institute. And I said, OK, intern, go out and get me the data that we have available for all industrialized countries, and let's create a regression with that data looking at economic performance uh, versus the size of government. You know what you would get? You would get pretty much what that chart showed. But then I would ask you, well, why don't you have any data for less than 20% of GDP? And you would say, well, Dan. There aren't any countries in the world today that spend less than 20% of GDP. So what you're really doing with the modern data is you're finding that Singapore and Hong Kong spend about 20% of GDP, and they grow faster than the US, Australia, and Switzerland, which spend somewhere around 35% of GDP, and US, Australia, and Switzerland grow faster than France and Italy and Belgium, which spend like 50% of GDP. So yeah, you get a downward sloping curve, but all you're doing is measuring the downward slope of the curve, because we don't have any countries left today that spend less than that. But we used to have them. Let's just skip to this chart right here. This is from a chart showing Sweden, UK, US, Japan, Germany, and France from 1870 to 1960. In 1870, the average size of government in those countries was less than 10% of GDP. If you believe the wrong curve research, they should have doubled the size of government. Obviously, that wouldn't have been logical. Uh, even as late as 1913, government averaged only 12 to 13 percent of GDP. Should they have increased government by two thirds? No, probably not. Uh, so, so, in some sense, I'm I'm being pointlessly academic here, because government is way above 20 percent of GDP. It would be a giant victory to get it back to 20 percent of GDP. So, why do I care about saying maybe it should be five percent of GDP? Well, because I'm a libertarian, and we're strange people. Uh, so the point is, government is far too big. It's way above the growth maximizing size now. And because of demographics, because of entitlements, it's going to get a lot worse. But maybe we should try to figure out how to make it smaller instead if we want a more prosperous, fast-growing economy. So here's my case for optimism. And I'll, I'll sort of I'll close on this so that people have a good taste in their mouth. 
The fiscal crisis in Europe, I can tell you from firsthand experience, has had a sobering effect. I used to go up to Capitol Hill during the Bush years. Republicans were in control. They're supposed to be the fiscally responsible party. I'd go up to Capitol Hill and I'd talk to these guys. And I'd say, why are you voting for this no bureaucrat left behind education bill? Why are you voting for this pork-filled uh, transportation bill? Why are you voting for this corrupt farm bill? Why are you voting for this Medicare prescription drug entitlement? Why are you voting for this TARP bailout? And it'd be like, you know, you know, catching a child, uh, you know, stealing something. Was, oh, man, I shouldn't have done that. I feel bad about that. But you know, i got to be loyal. Bush is the president. He's part of my party. So I sort of went along with it. I know it's the wrong thing to do. It's like being in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting or something like that. You know, my name is Politician Joe. I'm a big spender. Uh, but they kept doing it. Even if they knew it was the wrong thing to do, they kept doing it. Uh, but now, when I go up to Capitol Hill and I show them some of this data, but more importantly than that, because they read in the newspapers about how societies in Western Europe are beginning to collapse and you're getting social disarray and chaos, and the only reason they're being even kept afloat is because of bailouts, a lot, lot of which, of course, are, are diverting and distorting capital flows in the world economy. We, we now have, I think, an understanding that something has to change because otherwise we're going to be that way as well. And that's a big difference. You can't really measure it, but it's there and it's real. And as I explained already, I think over time it's going to become apparent that you can't tax your way out of a spending problem. Matter of fact, the taxing approach will make the spending problem worse. And here's, you know, maybe this is too optimistic, but I do think when every other option is exhausted, maybe, just maybe, politicians will do the right thing. I don't know, if, if you read Atlas Shrugged, you, you'd think they won't do the right thing, and then you figure out how you're going to escape to Costa Rica or Australia or New Zealand or something like that. But let me give you an example of why I think there's hope. Politicians don't like, as I said in one of my early slides, they don't like taking goodies away from people. As a matter of fact, they like giving goodies to people. That's how you buy votes. That's how you get campaign contributions. Uh, I remember what, way back when, when I worked for Senator Bob Packwood. He was sort of a middle-of-the-road Republican type from Oregon. And he didn't vote with the fiscal conservatives a lot. And I remember there was an amendment on the floor of the Senate. This was back in like 1989. I'm a little bit older than some of you. Uh, there was an uh, amendment on the floor of the Senate to defund the National Endowment for the Arts. There was a controversy because they were funding pornographic art. But I was telling the senator, it doesn't matter what they're funding. It's just not a function of the federal government to subsidize art. And the senator thought about that and said, no, I'm going to vote against the amendment. And I said, but don't you agree it's not a federal government responsibility to fund art? And he sort of looks at me with this sort of bemused, grandfatherly look. You know, didn't quite pat me on the head. Uh, but in a very almost patronizing fashion, he said, Dan, you know what's going to happen if I go down to the floor of the Senate and vote to defund the NEA? It means the amendment, instead of getting 18 votes, will get 19 votes. But back home in Oregon, the newspapers will say, I'm against art. And back home in Oregon, all the local Republican women's clubs will start yelling at me. Why? Because those are precisely the people, the, the wives of rich people, who get put on those local arts councils that divvy up the NEA money. And they'll all be angry at me. So why would I want to bring that upon myself for a symbolic vote? Now, he told me, I don't know if this is true. He said, but you know what, Dan? If I was the 51st vote to get rid of the National Endowment for the Arts, I would do it. Yeah, I'd have to put up with a month of people complaining. I'd have to put up with a month of newspapers saying I was a Philistine. But I would do it because we actually achieved something at the end of the day. And people would learn, hey, guess what? The arts are still there. They don't need to be mooching off the government after all. So why am I telling this story? Because, as I said, politicians don't like to cast symbolic votes against goodies. But for three years in a row, the House of Representatives, and this is what I just said about how they've sobered up a bit, for three years in a row, the House of Representatives in 2011, 2012, 2013, we'll see whether they do it this year, for three years in a row, they voted for substantial entitlement reform, block granting of Medicaid, and significant restructuring of Medicare. And they knew when they cast those votes that they were setting themselves up for campaign commercials that said they don't care about old people, that they want to push granny off a cliff into a river. But they still did it. They still did it. And I think the reason they did it was legitimate patriotism. They knew there was a problem. They knew they had to take a stand. So even though they knew it wasn't going to go anywhere in the Senate, and even though they knew that Obama would never approve it, 
they did it anyhow. That, to me, gives me hope. It shows that politicians were really willing to do, every so often, the right thing for the right reason. So let's actually talk a little bit about what the answer can be. Here's really all you need to know about the budget in Washington. Even with very weak growth, because that's we have a very weak recovery. I mean, it's, it's, we, we're, we are in the middle of the second weakest recovery since the end of World War II and the weakest recovery in terms of jobs since World War II. So making government bigger has not been a very successful thing for our economy. But even that, with that weak economic expansion that we're in the middle of, guess what? CBO is projecting nominal tax revenue to grow 5.5 uh, to 6% a year. Now, you don't need to be a math scientist to realize, okay, if revenue is growing this fast, what do I have to do to make fiscal progress? Here's where it would be good to have some Jeopardy music playing. Ah, the answer is just have government spending grow by a slower amount. That's all you have to do to make progress. Now, like I said, I'm a libertarian. I want to shut down entire departments. I want to cut government spending dramatically. I want to bring it back down to 3% of GDP at the federal level, which is where it was for much of our nation's history. But we don't need to do that. We should do it, but we don't need to. All we have to do is make sure government grows slower than the private sector. Because what is the private sector? The private sector is your tax base. So if you have, even with a weak expansion, as I said, you're still spinning off lots of revenue every single year. On average, unless you're in a recession, revenues go up. So the whole question of trying to sort of bring red ink under control and to slowly reduce the burden of government spending, you just have to have government grow slower than the private sector. And if you do that, here's a chart from the, from the new Congressional Budget Office data. It basically shows the blue line is projected revenue over the next 10 years. And the, uh, the other line on the left simply shows where we are right now in terms of government spending. If you freeze government spending, you balance the budget in 2017. If it goes up at about the rate of inflation, you balance it in 2019. And then, of course, if you let it grow like, I don't know, 3% a year or something, you balance it over 10 years. It doesn't take much to actually balance a budget. Now, again, I don't think balancing the budget is the goal. Shrinking the burden of government is the goal. But if you shrink the burden of government, if you address the underlying disease, you solve the symptom of deficits. Here's my analogy on that. Oh, I have a headache. I have a headache. I go to the doctor. The doctor does all these MRIs and CAT scans and says, Dan, you have a brain tumor. Do I then say to the doctor, can you give me some aspirin for my headache? Or do I say, solve the underlying problem, figure out how to get the tumor out of my head? Government spending is the tumor. The headache is the symptom. The headache is the deficits and the debt. But a modest bit of spending restraint balances the budget if you happen to think that's the main goal. And I call this Mitchell's golden rule. My friend Art Laffer, he's famous for the Laffer Curve. I have to name things after myself. This is really, you have to find the type of humility and humbleness in Washington to have people name things after themselves. But that's what I've done. Because I actually think it's a pretty good rule. If you follow this rule, if the private sector grows faster than the government, over the long run, your problems get solved. But if the ratio is reversed, and government's growing faster than the private sector, as I said before, no amount of tax increases in the long run are going to save you from becoming Greece. So that's really all we have to do. Revenues grow, grow every single year. Just have spending grow by less than that, and, uh, and you get good uh, results. Let me just show you some examples real quickly of nations that have reformed that I'll shut up for questions. Uh, the first thing I want to do is talk about the country I think is the best example. Not that it has the smallest government, but it has the best fiscal rule in place. It's, it's called the debt break in Switzerland, but it's actually a spending cap because it basically says any given year, spending can't grow faster than uh, something roughly equal to inflation plus population. It's actually based on a ratio of previous year's revenue increases, all very complicated to, to explain, but it's there and it works. Now, in theory, the Keynesians should like this. Because if you have a recession and your revenues actually go down, the debt break doesn't force you to cut spending. But it says when the economy is going OK and it's spending off a lot of revenue, you can't spend it all. And let's look at what's actually, oh, I, I can go backwards with this. Cool, I learned something new. This is a chart showing what's happened ever since the debt break was put in by 85.7% of Swiss voters in a referendum. Government spending has been growing slower than GDP. As a result, the burden of government spending is shrinking as a share of GDP. And while the rest of Europe is in fiscal crisis, Switzerland is in strong shape. It's not a balanced budget rule. If there's a recession, they can have a deficit. 
But as I said before, the key thing is when the economy is growing okay and it's just spinning off a lot of revenue, the politicians aren't allowed to spend it. Here are some other examples. Ireland had a four-year period many, many years ago of a spending freeze back in the 1980s. Look what happened to spending and deficits as a share of GDP. They fell dramatically. Again, you, saw, you deal with the problem of government spending. You also deal with the symptom of red ink. Here's Slovakia, last decade, three-year period. Government grew only 1% a year. There's a recession, so there's a kink in the line. But you see that deficits and spending are both falling. Here's New Zealand, five years where spending did not go up. Look at what happened. Dramatic reduction in government spending, and they went from a big budget uh, deficit to a big budget surplus. Here's Canada, a five-year period of 1% spending growth. They also went from a huge deficit to a budget surplus, and government spending came down as a share of GDP, which is, in my mind, the more important thing. More recently, we have Estonia, a three-year period of spending growing 1% a year. And what happened? Again, there's a recession there, the financial crisis, but government spending, and they're now in a budget surplus. The rest of Europe's in recession. Estonia is the most free market country in Europe. They have a budget surplus. Uh, and there are lots of other examples. I, on my blog today, I just did one. I just uh, looked at the German data from last decade. But Sweden, Hong Kong, Germany, Israel, Netherlands, Singapore, Taiwan are all examples where countries, for a, at least some period of years, restrained government spending, got very good results. But Switzerland is the best example because all these examples I'm showing you, other than Switzerland, the good period, the good policy ended. The politicians were not able to sustain and maintain their fiscal discipline. So you have to put in some sort of external check on the political class so their normal temptation to overspend and buy votes can, can somehow be curtailed. And I think the Swiss debt break gives us exactly that. We even have some good examples from the US. I'll just show the charts real fast. During the Reagan years, this is total domestic spending, so-called discretionary, but also entitlements. Under Reagan, as a share of GDP, that spending fell. Under Clinton, it fell. Remember, I criticized one Republican Bush, one Democrat Obama. Now I praise one Republican Reagan, one Democrat Clinton. Look at the Bush-Obama years. By contrast, what's happened to domestic spending as a share of GDP? Even if you measure it in inflation-adjusted dollars, yeah, it grew under both Reagan and Clinton, but it grew by less than the private sector, which is why it shrank as a share of GDP. Uh, and let's actually now give a tiny bit of optimism about the current era. Remember, we had spending restraint during the Clinton era, and then we had the Bush-Obama spending binge. But look what happened in 2012 and 2013. We actually reduced government spending in nominal dollars. And it was during that two years, by the way, that the deficit went from $1.3 trillion to $640 billion. So if you, if you think that, I mean, again, I want you to come out of this meeting thinking that the problem is government spending. But if you're focused on balancing budgets and deficits and debt, we got the progress when we restrained and actually reduced government spending. A giant deficit fell in half by simply basically freezing, slightly reducing government spending in nominal dollars. So even during the last couple of years of Obama, because by the way, this, this chart was two years ago. So it, now it probably makes more sense to break Bush and Obama out because Obama has been forced by the Tea Party and all that to dramatically restrain government spending. So what are our challenges? These are my closing thoughts. We have to correctly identify the problem. It's government, combined with demographics, I suppose I should say. We need to figure out how to bend the cost curve of government down. Again, my libertarian fantasy world, we reduce it. But in reality, all we need to do is make sure it grows slower than the private sector. But I suspect at the end of the day, we will only achieve that if we convince people that liberty is better than dependency. So. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer questions. There's no clock, so I don't know whether. Uh, well, there, there's a clock. Uh, I wasn't too bad, but I, I rattled on for a while. Questions? Yes. Uh, well, yeah, the, the, there are standard jokes in Canada and Mexico that uh, if, uh, if America catches a cold, we get a fever. Uh, 
Uh, so yeah, a lot of countries are very dependent on, uh, I mean, heck, for that matter, we're dependent on world trade. If there was, I mean, we're a lot bigger economically than Canada or Mexico, but if they had serious turmoil or recessions, we would feel it in at least some of the sectors of our economy. Uh, I think the biggest impact, though, uh, looking around the world, is, uh, is examples. Uh, as I said before, what's happened in Europe has sobered up some American politicians and made them more willing to do the right thing for the right reason. Uh, is that a universal thing? No. Uh, but I think it makes a difference. I think uh, con countries look at, say, in Latin America, Chile has dramatically outstripped the rest of Latin America in growth. I mean, dramatic. I mean, they're, they're now an OECD member country. Uh, you know, the rest of Latin America is still relatively poor. Well, Chile has done it by being much more free market. If you look at the economic freedom of the world rankings, Chile is and sometimes in the top 10. No other Latin countries are anywhere close. Uh, so I've always wondered, why don't other Latin countries sort of look, well, Chile's really growing fast. Why don't we do the same thing? But just at Cato yesterday, we had the former finance minister of Argentina in, and he's basically saying, my country's screwed. Why? Because the people there just, I mean, Argentina is such a sad story. At the end of World War II, it was one of the 10 richest countries in the world. Now it's way, way down, like around 60 or 65. Uh, you know, the, the, they've had very weak growth, while other places have had very strong growth. Uh, so I would think the, I mean, the international evidence, whenever I'm debating a, a leftist or a statist, uh, the international evidence is always where I think I do better in the debate. Uh, and I think that international evidence, the, 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 the examples, I think, are very, very powerful. But for some reason, for some people, they don't seem to matter. Uh, that, that's a very good question because Greece doesn't have a central bank anymore. Well, actually, it does have a central bank because bureaucrats never go away, but it doesn't have its own monetary policy anymore because they're part of the euro. Normally, you look at countries like Zimbabwe and Argentina, what do they do when they want to spend more money and no one will lend it to them? They just run the printing presses and, uh, and have inflation. Uh, Greece can't do that. Italy can't do that. Spain can't do that. That's one of the reasons why... Now, I think it's good that they can't do it because you don't want to augment bad fiscal policy with bad monetary policy, but it basically means that they, they, they hit the crisis sooner. Uh, we have our own currency. So yeah, in theory, at some point in the future when everything really get, begins to get dicey for the United States, we can just print money. And because we are the 800-pound gorilla in the world economy and we're the world's reserve currency, we can probably get away with that for a little bit longer than you would normally think. But we can't get away with it forever. As a matter of fact, the, the, some of the recent data on the Chinese no longer buying as much of our government debt and the Fed buying it all because of QE, uh, you know, that, that should worry us. I mean, w I think a lot of people are beginning to look at the U.S., look at these numbers and say, maybe we don't want to be quite so reliant on the dollar and on, on U.S. debt anymore. Uh, so it is a problem. But right now, we're the tallest midget in the circus. I mean, we, n we may not be great, but we're better than Japan. And in the short run, at least, we're better than uh, France and the UK and Germany and Italy and so on and so forth. In the long run, some of these numbers show us being worse than those countries. Yeah, that, that's the big income inequality issue that we now found, find in Washington. The best thing for class mobility is a lot of economic growth. A lot of economic growth, you get what economists and social scientists call churning. I mean, by definition, you know, by definition, there's always half the people above the median and half the people below the median. It's not Lake Wobegon where we're all above average. So the question is, okay, in any given year, the top 20% by definition are going to be the top 20% and the bottom 20% are going to be the bottom 20%. The problem is sometimes people look at this data and say, okay, well, gee, in 1979, the top 20% got this share of income and now they're getting this share of income and it's bigger. And people make a mistake in assuming the top 20% are the same people. But over time, if you do what are called longitudinal studies, you see that people are rising and falling through the income brackets over time, and that's a good thing. Now, 
there is some evidence that that's beginning to dissipate. And the question is, why? Uh, is it dissipating because rich people have learned to become crony capitalists and, and rely on government? Uh, things like you know TARP bailouts to preserve their wealth, uh, even if they don't deserve it because they made bad investments. On the flip side, you have welfare programs that sort of create and subsidize long-term intergenerational poverty. Uh, so is that keeping people in the bottom 20% from climbing up? Uh, I, I don't think we have great answers on this the, other than economic growth anywhere and everywhere has always been the best tonic uh, to create upward mobility. Uh, and, and again, that economic growth, there is a relationship between policy and growth, and as government gets bigger, even if it's getting bigger supposedly to help the less fortunate, because that's, you know, look at France. They have programs to help every possible uh, low-income person in the world, but all it does is create sort of this dependency class in the French population, whereas Hong Kong and Singapore have virtually no welfare state, that there's almost no government benefits you can access. Uh, you, people have to rely on their families uh, and on private charity. And in Hong Kong and Singapore, you have a lot of social mobility, a lot of growth, and people come in dirt poor, and they wind up becoming rich. So I, I think the, the free market example is by far the best one to follow, not that I would uh, begin to claim it's going to solve everything. I mean, in some cases, w we have we have we have societal issues that are probably independent now of economics. Uh, if, you have, if you have rampant single motherhood, and I'm not talking about single motherhood for yuppies, you know, some woman who's 38 decides to have a baby because she doesn't think any of her marriage prospects are any good, okay, she can afford that. And she probably has a family network, her own mother and things like that. They're going to help take care of the kid or she can afford nannies. But single motherhood in the modern society generally means poor people, who don't really have any family network that can help them, and it means government dependency. And when you have that kind of environment, then that per the kids who are raised in those families, the social pathologies that are associated with that are very, very serious and probably relatively now impervious to change because it's very difficult to put toothpaste back in a tube. Uh, that's a very good question. I skipped over this slide right here, uh, but it, it's how I usually address that issue. Uh, because all, whenever I'm speaking, especially if I'm speaking in like Eastern Europe, the transition economies, or I'm speaking in Latin America, that's frequently a question I get. Wait, you're telling us we should have small government, but look at Sweden, look at Germany. These are rich countries, and they seem to be doing okay, yet they have much, much bigger government. So why shouldn't we emulate them instead of emulating Hong Kong? And this is what I tell them. The data is that Europe's welfare, st the, the rich welfare states in Europe became rich when they didn't have the welfare state. Think about it. Uh, matter of fact, that, that was the reason I had this slide was the next slide. Sweden, even as late as 1960, government was only like 35% of GDP, which is smaller than what it is in America today. And when Sweden became rich, government was 10% of GDP, 12% of GDP. So Sweden became rich, and for that matter, Denmark and Germany, they all became rich when government was very small and you had free markets. Now, once they become rich, then they adopt a welfare state. And Sweden now, instead of growing 4% a year, grows 2% a year. But you know what? If you want to adopt a welfare state, I'm going to say, go ahead but do it the way Sweden did. And this is what I tell people like in Romania and Paraguay and places like that. Yes, copy Sweden, but copy Sweden of 1870, not Sweden of 2014, because it was the Sweden of 1870 with very, very small government and free markets that became rich. Once they became rich, they made a decision, which I disagree with, to grow 2% a year with a welfare state instead of 4% a year. And they used to be, in 1970, they were the fourth richest economy in the world. Now they're down to number 18. So they've lost ground, but they're still a rich country. If you're, if you're already rich and you grow slow, you're doing okay. But if you're a poor country and you never have that rapid growth, then you suffer. Uh, so it's really important when you're looking at countries like Sweden. And Sweden, by the way, it's not just one government became big. 
for whatever reason, the Swedes run government more efficiently with less corruption than the Greeks. I don't mean to stereotype, but that's just the way it is. Uh, so the Northern Europeans in general do a better job with big government than the Southern Europeans, but even with the Northern Europeans, it has negative consequences. Uh, so you know, Greece might be lucky to grow 1% a year, Sweden can grow 2% a year, but both of them would grow a lot faster if they went back in time historically for when they had uh, the very small governments. All this stuff, by the way, every day on my blog, which should be the very first thing you look at on the internet, not, not, not dirty pictures or anything like that. You should be looking at international liberty, because just today I did a post about, I think I mentioned Germany, and when they had a, their period of good fiscal policy. So it's very educational. As a matter of fact, there should be extra credit for people who, uh, who uh, read my blog. I guess that uh, covers it. Uh, thank you very much for putting up with boring fiscal policy on an afternoon.